This audio case is brought to you by Laudio. United States et al. versus Carol Towing Corporation Incorporated et al. The opinion is given by Circuit Judge Hand. These appeals concern the sinking of the barge Anna C. on January 4, 1944, off Pier 51 North River. The Connors Marine Co. Incorporated was the owner of the barge, which the Pennsylvania Railroad Company had chartered. The Grace Line Incorporated was the charterer of the tug Carroll, of which the Carroll Towing Co. Incorporated was the owner. The decree in the limitation proceeding held the Carroll Company liable to the United States for the loss of the barge's cargo of flour, and to the Pennsylvania Railroad Company for expenses in solving the cargo and barge, and it held the Carroll Company also liable to the Connors Company for one-half the damage to the barge, these liabilities being all subject to limitation. The decree in the libel suit held the Grace Line primarily liable for the other half of the damage to the barge, and for any part of the first half not recovered against the Carroll Company because of limitation of liability. It also held the Pennsylvania Railroad secondarily liable for the same amount that the Grace Line was liable. The Carroll Company and the Pennsylvania Railroad Company have filed assignments of error. The facts as the judge found them were as follows. On June 20, 1943, the Connors Company chartered the barge Anna C. to the Pennsylvania Railroad Company at a stated hire per diem by a charter of the kind usual in the harbor, which included the services of a bargee, apparently limited to the hours 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. On January 2, 1944, the barge, which had lifted the cargo of flour, was made fast off the end of Pier 58 on the Manhattan side of the North River, whence she was later shifted to Pier 52. At some time not disclosed, five other barges were moored outside her, extending into the river. Her lines to the pier were not then strengthened. At the end of the next pier north, called the Public Pier, lay four barges, and a line had been made fast from the outermost of these to the fourth barge of the tier hanging to Pier 52. The purpose of this line is not entirely apparent, and in any event it obstructed entrance to the slip between the two piers of barges. The Grace Line, which had chartered the tug Carroll, sent her down to the Locus and Quo to drill out one of the barges which lay at the end of the public pier, and in order to do so, it was necessary to throw off the line between the two tiers. On board the Carroll at the time were not only her master, but a harbor master employed by the Grace Line. Before throwing off the line between the two tiers, the Carroll nosed up against the outer barge of the tier lying off Pier 52, ran a line from her own stem to the middle bit of that barge, and kept working her engines slow ahead against the ebb tide, which was making at that time. The captain of the Carroll put a deck hand and the harbor master on the barges, told them to throw off the line which barred the entrance to the slip, but before doing so, to make sure that the tier on Pier 52 was safely moored, as there was a strong northerly wind blowing down the river. The harbor master and the deckhand went aboard the barges and readjusted all the fasts to their satisfaction, including those from the Anna Sea to the pier. After doing so, they threw off the line between the two tiers and again boarded the carrel, which backed away from the outside barge, preparatory to drilling out the barge she was after in the tier off the public pier. She had only got about 75 feet away when the tier off Pier 52 broke adrift, because the fasts from the Anna Sea either rendered or carried away. The tide and wind carried down the six barges, still holding together, until the Anna Sea fetched up against a tanker lying on the north side of the pier below, Pier 51, whose propeller broke a hole in her at or near her bottom. Shortly thereafter, i.e. at about 2.15 p.m., she careened, dumped her cargo of flour, and sank. The tug Grace, owned by the Grace Line and the Carol, came to the help of the flotilla after it broke loose, and as both had siphon pumps on board, they could have kept the Annecy afloat had they learned of her condition, but the bargee had left her on the evening before, and nobody was on board to observe that she was leaking. The Grace Line wishes to exonerate itself from all liability because the harbor master was not authorized to pass on the sufficiency of the fasts of the Anna Sea, which held the tier to Pier 52. The Carroll Company wishes to charge the Grace Line with the entire liability because the harbor master was given an overall authority. Both wish to charge the Anna Sea with a share of all her damages, or at least with so much as resulted from her sinking. The Pennsylvania Railroad Company also wishes to hold the barge liable. The Connors Company wishes the decrees to be affirmed. The first question is whether the Grace Line should be held liable at all for any part of the damages. The answer depends first upon how far the harbor master's authority went, for conceitedly he was an employee of some sort. Although the judge made no other finding of fact than that he was an employee, in his second conclusion of law he held that the Grace Line was responsible for his negligence. 
Since the facts on which he based this liability do not appear, we cannot give that weight to the conclusion which we should to a finding of fact. But it so happens that on cross-examination, the harbor master showed that he was authorized to pass on the sufficiency of the facts of the Annecy. He said that it was part of his job to tie up barges, that when he came to tie up a barge, he had to go in and look at the barges that are inside the barge he was handling, that in such cases, most of the time he went in to see that the lines to the inside barges are strong enough to hold these barges, and that if they are not, he put out sufficient other lines as are necessary. That does not, however, determine the other question, i.e. whether when the master of the carol told him in the deckhand to go aboard the tier and look at the fasts, preparatory to casting off the line between the tiers, the tug master meant the harbor master to exercise a joint authority with the deckhand. As to this, the judge in his tenth finding said, the captain of the carol then put the deckhand of the tug and the harbor master aboard the boats at the end of Pier 52 to throw off the line between the two tiers of boats after first ascertaining if it would be safe to do so. Whatever doubts the testimony of the harbor master might raise, this finding settles it for us that the master of the carol deputed the deckhand and the harbor master jointly to pass upon the sufficiency of the Annecy's fast to the pier. The case is stronger against the Grace Line than Rice versus the Marion A.C. Messick was against the tug there held liable, because the tug had only acted under the express orders of the harbor master. Here, although the relations were reversed, that makes no difference in principle, and the harbor master was not instructed what he should do about the fast, but was allowed to use his own judgment. The fact that the deckhand shared in this decision did not exonerate him, and there is no reason why both should not be held equally liable as the judge held them. We cannot, however, excuse the Connors Company for the bargee's failure to care for the barge, and we think that this prevents full recovery. First, as to the facts. As we've said, the deckhand and the harbor master jointly undertook to pass upon the Annecy's fast to the pier. And even though we assume that the bargee was responsible for his fasts after the other barges were added outside, there is not the slightest ground for saying that the deckhand and the harbor master would have paid any attention to any protest which he might have made had he been there. We do not, therefore, attribute it as in any degree a fault of the Anna C. that the flotilla broke adrift. Hence, she may recover in full against the Carroll Company and the Grace Line for any injury she suffered from the contact with the tanker's propeller, which we shall speak of as the collision damages. On the other hand, if the bargee had been on board and had done his duty to his employer, he would have gone below at once, examined the injury, and called for help from the Carroll and the Grace Line tug. Moreover, it's clear that these tugs could have kept the barge afloat until they had safely beached her and saved her cargo. This would have avoided what we shall call the sinking damages. Thus, if it was a failure in the Connor Company's proper care of its own barge for the bargee to be absent, the company can recover only one-third of the sinking damages from the Carroll Company and one-third from the Grace Line. For this reason, the question arises whether a barge owner is slack in the care of his barge if the bargee is absent. As to the consequences of a bargee's absence from his barge, there have been a number of decisions, and we cannot agree that it is never ground for liability even to other vessels who may be injured. As early as 1843, Judge Sprague in Clap v. Young held a schooner liable which broke adrift from her moorings in a gale in Provincetown Harbor and ran down another ship. The ground was that the owners of the offending ship had left no one on board, even though it was the custom in that harbor not to do so. Judge Tenney in Fenno v. the Mary E. Cuff treated it as one of several faults against another vessel which was run down to leave the offending vessel unattended in a storm in Port Jefferson Harbor. Judge Thomas, in the On the Level, held liable for damage to a stake boat, a barge moored to the stake boat south of Liberty Light off the Jersey shore because she had been left without a bargee. Indeed, he declared that the bargee's absence was gross negligence. In the Catherine B. Gwinnon, Ward J. did indeed say that when a barge was made fast to appear in the harbor, as distinct from being in open waters, the bargee's absence would not be the basis for the owner's negligence. However, the facts in that case made no such holding necessary. The offending barge, in fact, had a bargee aboard, though he was asleep. In the Beco, Judge Campbell exonerated a powerboat, which had no watchman on board, which boys had maliciously cast loose from her moorings at the Marine Basin in Brooklyn, and which collided with another vessel. Obviously, that decision has no bearing on the facts at bar. In United States Trucking Corporation v. City of New York, the same judge refused to reduce the recovery of a coal hoister injured at a foul berth because the engineer was not on board. He had gone home for the night, as was apparently his custom. We reversed the decree, but for another reason. 
In the Sadie, we affirmed Judge Coleman's holding that it was actionable negligence to leave without a bargee on board a barge made fast outside another barge in the face of storm warnings. The damage was done to the inside barge. In the PRR number 216, we charged with liability a lighter which broke loose from or was cast off by a tanker to which she was moored on the ground that her bargee should not have left her over Sunday. He could not know when the tanker might have to cast her off. We carried this so far in the East Indian as to hold a lighter whose bargee went ashore for breakfast, during which the stevedores cast off some of the lighter's lines. True, the bargee came back after she was free and was then ineffectual in taking control of her before she damaged another vessel, but we held his absence itself a fault, knowing as he must have that the stevedores were apt to cast off the lighter. The Conway number 23 went on the theory that the absence of the bargee had no connection with the damage done to the vessel itself. It assumed liability if the contrary had been proved. In the Trenton, we refused to hold a moored vessel because another outside of her had overcharged her fasts. The bargee had gone away for the night when a storm arose, and our exoneration of the offending vessel did depend upon the theory that it was not negligent for the bargee to be away for the night, but no danger was apparently then to be apprehended. In Booker Contracting Co. v. Williamsburg Power Plant Corporation, we charged a SKU with half damages because her bargee left her without adequate precautions. In O'Donnell Transportation Co. v. M&J Tracy, we refused to charge a barge whose bargee had been absent from 9 a.m. to 1.30 p.m., having left the vessel to go ashore for a time on his own business. It appears from the foregoing review that there is no general rule to determine when the absence of a bargee or other attendant will make the owner of the barge liable for injuries to other vessels if she breaks away from her moorings. However, in any cases where he would be so liable for injuries to others, obviously he must reduce his damages proportionately, if the injury is to his own barge. It becomes apparent why there can be no such general rule when we consider the grounds for such a liability. Since there are occasions when every vessel will break from her moorings, and since, if she does, she becomes a menace to those about her, the owner's duty, as in other similar situations, to provide against resulting injuries is a function of three variables. 1. The probability that she will break away. 2. The gravity of the resulting injury if she does. 3. The burden of adequate precautions. Possibly it serves to bring this notion into relief to state it in algebraic terms. If the probability be called P, the injury L, and the burden B, liability depends upon whether B is less than L multiplied by P, i.e. whether B less than PL. Applied to the situation at bar, the likelihood that a barge will break from her fasts and the damage she will do vary with the place and time. For example, if a storm threatens, the danger is greater. So it is if she's in a crowded harbor where moored barges are constantly being shifted about. On the other hand, the barge must not be the bargee's prison, even though he lives aboard, he must go ashore at times. We need not say whether, even in such crowded waters as New York Harbor, a bargee must be aboard at night at all. It may be that the custom is otherwise, as Ward J. supposed in the Catherine B. Guinan, and that, if so, the situation is one where custom should control. We leave that question open, but we hold that it is not, in all cases, a sufficient answer to a bargee's absence without excuse, during working hours, that he has properly made fast his barge to appear when he leaves her. In the case at bar, the bargee left at 5 o'clock in the afternoon of January 3rd, and the flotilla broke away at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon of the following day, 21 hours afterwards. The bargee had been away all the time, and we hold that his fabricated story was affirmative evidence that he had no excuse for his absence. At the locus in quo, especially during the short January days and the full tide of war activity, barges were being constantly drilled in and out. Certainly it was not beyond reasonable expectation that, with the inevitable haste and bustle, the work might not be done with adequate care. In such circumstances we hold, and it is all that we do hold, that it was a fair requirement that the Connors Company should have a bargee aboard, unless he had some excuse for his absence during the working hours of daylight. The decrees will be modified as follows. In the libel of the Connors Company against the Pennsylvania Railroad Company in which the Grace Line was impleted, since the Grace Line is liable in Salido and the Carroll Company was not impleted, the decree must be for full collision damages and half sinking damages, and the Pennsylvania Railroad Company will be secondarily liable. In the limitation proceeding of the Carroll Company, the privilege of limitation being conceded, the claim of the United States and of the Pennsylvania Railroad Company will be allowed in full. Since the claim of the Connors Company for collision damages will be collected full in the libel against the Grace Line, the claim will be disallowed pro tanto. 
The claim of the Connors Company for sinking damages being allowed for one half in the libel will be allowed for only one sixth in the limitation proceeding. The Grace Line has claimed for only so much as the Connors Company may recover in the libel. That means that its claim will be one half the collision damages and for one sixth the sinking damages. If the fund be large enough, the result will be to throw one half the collision damages upon the Grace Line and one half on the Carroll Company, and one third of the sinking damages on the Connors Company, the Grace Line, and the Carroll Company each. If the fund is not large enough, the Grace Line will not be able altogether to recoup itself in the limitation proceeding for its proper contribution from the Carroll Company. Decrees reversed and cause remanded for further proceedings in accordance with the foregoing. For more audio cases, visit us at laudioforlisteners.com. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel.